Trinity Sunday stands alone as on which the preacher is invited to consider a church doctrine, namely the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. I don't know about you, but every time um, we bless ourselves, we proclaim the mystery of the Trinity. And only the Christian religion teaches that there are three persons in one God. It is a mystery we will never be able to fully comprehend. Yet, it is the heart and soul of our Christian life. In the life of the church, we have special days. And these special days are intended to remember specific historic events in the life of Christ, such as Easter, as we remember Christ's resurrection, Pentecost, as we remember the Holy Spirit came and uh, lived within uh, the first Christians. But today, Trinity Sunday in the church's year is dedicated to a doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity. And the doctrine of the Trinity contrasted with the triadic formulas and uh, the triple structures of the biblical experiences of God, it is implicit rather than explicit in Scripture. By triple structure of biblical experience, we mean that in both the Old and the New Testament, God is, as, is experienced as going forth out of himself in revelation and redemptive action, and also creating in human hearts a believing response to his revelatory and redemptive action. When I was in seminary, one of our professors who was a, a real character pontificated in real Bajan parlance. That preaching on Trinity Sunday is not for the faint of heart, and that most of us, once ordained, would discover the stealthy wisdom of inviting another priest <laughs> to preach or to do the job. But here I am again today on this Trinity Sunday with no one to call on. And so I am invited once again, to attempt to explain this doctrine of the Trinity. And some persons might be surprised that when they go through, or some fundamentals will say, but we don't see it in the Bible. But if they perhaps go to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, and hear um, the writer of Matthew saying, Go therefore and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of God the Father, and of the Holy Spirit. Yes. However, the term Trinitas did not find its way into the Christian lexicon until around the year 200, when Tertullian was raging a radical war against those who refused to acknowledge the divine nature of Jesus. And so today, when Christians hear Jesus saying to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And that when in the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. This morning, we should be concerned what are the other things that Jesus had to share with his disciples? And guess what? I plan to ask him when that time comes. And I hope that you do too. You see, it makes one feel uncomfortable when someone important to you says that they have something to tell you 
but asks you to wait until later. How one becomes anxious when the conversation starts with, can we talk later? Our anxiety attempts to prepare us for the very worst. Think about when HR calls you to the office, or in my case, the bishop says, Gregory, I want to have a chat with you, but says, we'll talk about it later. What possibly could they have to tell us? Are they angry with us? Are we going to be fired? Are they leaving us? Are they sick? Are they dying? Are they going to give us a promotion or a raise? In such scenarios, we expend more time and energy playing out the, the worst case scenario than we actually do in participating in the conversation. Just imagine how challenging this must have been for the disciples when Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I do not know about you, but I have a great difficulty hearing such a statement and not feeling slighted. Perhaps just like the disciples, given that Jesus spent much of his ministry preparing them for his death, what could he possibly have to, to say to them that would be worthier to bear? Perhaps it is not the disciples' it's capacity to handle troubling information that Jesus is concerned about. Rather, Jesus knows there is so much more to live in his way, embodying God's love on earth, than the disciples can make sense of in their particular time and the context. However, Jesus' comment does not cushion the blow of anxiety and anticipatory grief that when the disciples would, would, would experience as their beloved teacher shares with them that he'll soon be gone. And not that he's going, but there's more to be learned. And you will make sense of it later. It is a human nature to fear the unknown and to stew over an uncertain future. Especially when the one you, you've leaned on for such time or the person who you, you've had confidence in who gave you that reassurance when you were going through all uncertainty. In saying to you, I have more to say to you, but you have to wait. Many of us are not adept at sitting with uncertainty and the uncomfortable feelings associated with it. Perhaps this is because we are so often told that negative emotions like fear and anger and worry and sadness are to be ejected, pushed aside, and forgotten as soon as possible. As a trained CPE um, counselor and a psychotherapist, sometimes when persons come to you for a counsel, and you tell them what they should hear, they leave feeling rather uncomfortable. Only to go to another genuine counselor to be told the same thing. 
what Jesus had to share with his disciples was too heavy for them at that time. And he preferred that the comforter would share the remainder of the good news. And so Jesus offered the Holy Spirit and offers the reassurance we need as we face the struggles of our time. As a community of faith, we have much to feel uncertain about. In times of, not only as we consider the state of our church, but also the future of our world. Hearing the Holy Spirit in Jesus continued presence with us, meeting us in our own time and our own space as we grapple with our particular challenges. And though the Holy Spirit will not cure the uncomfortable feelings associated with uncertainty, he will provide the loving presence made known to us in the person of Jesus as we sit and flesh out those feelings. The present pandemic, economic injustices which produce high costs of living, shortage of medicines in places where medicines originate, continued slavery over others, oppression of persons who do not share our same values. Perhaps these are some of the things Jesus wanted to say to us, but we cannot bear the weight of what he has to say. And so the comforter comes and suddenly shares with us the things we are capable of bearing appropriately. As followers of Jesus, we are asked to sit in the unwanted feelings for just a moment longer and to be reassured that through the Holy Spirit, we already have what we need, even when it does not feel that way. Today, the writer of the Gospel of John offers us a sense of hope through the Holy Spirit as it provides the answer to crises of life. John conceives of the Holy Spirit as a divine comforter who persists in guiding communities of faith such as ours in the way of Jesus after the physical life on the earth has ended. The Holy Spirit is the eternal promise to communities like us, communities of faith as we experience God's loving presence with humankind. Yes, the Spirit of Christ, the Comforter, the Advocate, the Paraclete, empowers community like ours to face the challenges that arise in various contexts with new understandings of Jesus' life and the teachings. The Holy Spirit, they are people of God, is the one who makes tangible the life and the teachings of Jesus for contemporary faith communities, thus assuring us of God's loving presence in the 21st century. As we face our own particular crises, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is there to comfort us. This week, I was quizzing um, a theologian about a particular subject, only to be reassured that as Christians, we are stronger than we actually know. Yes, there are people of St. Julian's. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are already have all we need to respond to the current needs in this world. 
we have already learned that all that we have whatever it takes to act at the appropriate time. While our particular crisis may be foreign to the disciples in Jesus' time, feelings of fear, anxiety, grief burn out. And pain, these are all universal. The disciples knew very well about injustice, violence, and suffering. And Jesus equipped them to face the manifestations of such challenges in their day. Jesus still equips us to handle those challenges in our present day. The Holy Spirit, the continued embodied presence of God's love through Jesus, makes possible the collective memory of how God has worked with communities of faith such as ours through generations. And as long as the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keeps reminding us who Jesus is in our lives, who continues to poke at us and reminds us through fresher understandings of Jesus' way of love and caring. We have nothing to worry about. This morning, dear people of God, as Jesus told his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. I do not know what Jesus had to tell his disciples. But I want us to hear Jesus saying that if we continue to love each other as Christ first loves us, then we will be better Christians. Amen. Amen. Let us pray.